Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Category Creation Series on the B2B Growth Show. I'm John Ruggi. Now, today we're going to talk to Jeff Benanto, and he is a marketing director at a company called Everbridge. Now, you may not have heard of Everbridge, but they have more than a $2 billion market cap on NASDAQ. And what's really interesting is that they are in the middle of trying to develop and evangelize a new category. So Jeff's going to tell us all about that journey. So stick around for our interview with Jeff Benanto from Everbridge. All right, Jeff, welcome to the show today. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started recording. And I think one of the interesting things about this episode is you guys are in the middle of building and evangelizing a category at, at Everbridge. And so I'm really excited to kind of hear how that journey's gone and what you're up to at the moment. But before we dive into that, can you just give me a quick background on your role at Everbridge and uh, what you guys do as a company? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks again for having me. I'm excited to, to speak with you today about, about this journey and the evangelizing uh, of the broader safety and security space that, that we are doing here at Everbridge and as part of our uh, category creation efforts. Uh, so a little bit of background, Everbridge, where the... Uh, we're the market leader in providing businesses, government agencies, and other organizations over the globe with a platform and suite of SaaS applications to support what we call critical event management. Uh, so what this means is, you know, we enable our customers to improve how they identify, manage, and respond to different events that may disrupt their daily operations and put the safety of their people, as well as their assets, their supply chain, and their reputations at risk. So we have over 4,500 of those customers now, and they range from mainstream brands that you know everyone has uh, heard of and likely interacts with on a daily basis, like Facebook or Starbucks, Walgreens, uh, companies like that, uh, to entire U.S. states, uh, like the, the state of Florida, for example, uh, uses Everbridge via their uh, Division of Emergency Management. And then we also work with you know, leading universities, healthcare entities, airports, uh, and beyond. And then my role with Everbridge uh, has evolved a bit. I've been with the company for over five years. Uh, So as any marketing professional within a high growth B2B organization, I've worn a a many different hats over that time. Obviously, we grew from a $30 million company uh, when I started to now well over uh, on track for $150 million in revenue uh, trading on the NASDAQ as as EVBG. So when I began, the marketing team was a lot smaller and I sort of owned all facets of marketing, communications, PR, AR, social media, content marketing, things of that nature related to broad awareness. Over time, I've also focused more within corporate communications, and now I'm in more of a hybrid role, still sitting within our communications group, but also owning our customer marketing efforts. So creating programs to support uh, customer engagement, retention, growth, as well as customer recognition and advocacy to really help support the company's brand. Good deal. So can you give me a little bit of context for this mass notification? What's an example of an event or situation that would that you guys would get involved in and, and notify these you know, states and universities and businesses about? Yeah, absolutely. 
So there's a, there's a broad range. You know, traditionally, when you think of mass notification, you may think uh, of a government agency messaging out to residents uh, during an emergency event like uh, a weather emergency. Uh, so up mm-hmm. here in the New England area, obviously, we have lots of snow emergencies. Uh, so it may be uh, messaging out to, to individuals uh, within a community to let them know uh, about impending snow, maybe that there's a parking ban, for example. Or it may be the message may be more urgent, maybe around um, you know a hurricane that's coming, and you know residents need to evacuate an area. But it can also be more community oriented. Again, on the on the public sector safety side, it could be around alerts related to a festival or some other sort of event, which will bring with it some traffic uh, concerns. So in those cases, the messages are a little bit less critical or time sensitive in nature, but they're still important to get out there. But on the business side, again, it's not just about messaging. Um, What we do is we really help centralize incident management and response activities for organizations. But these types of events that our clients will use us around will range from those similar emergencies, you know, reaching out to uh, employees to let them know, you know, an office might be closed due to a weather emergency or, you know, sticking with weather as an example, it may be reaching out to an employee who's traveling uh, to a certain area that might actually be in the path of a storm. In that case, you're not reaching out to the employee to let them know, hey, your office is closed. You're reaching out to them to confirm they're safe and that maybe they have a place where they're able to work. That's not uh, the site where they were originally scheduled to be, but primarily it's to confirm their safety. Uh, but it's also operational things too, right? It could be um, communications around product recalls, supply chain disruptions, uh, inventory related issues, IT outages. You know, we have uh, a product that is part of our offering that is custom designed for IT operations professionals to communicate more effectively uh, and collaborate more effectively when there's IT uh, incidents that require fast alerts, confirmations, getting folks on a bridge to triage uh, incidents as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there and a lot to unpack. And um, I, th- I think that's going to give us some good insight into why the, the category you've been talking about, this mass notification category. I know you're going to talk about why it was maybe holding you back a little bit in terms of your addressable market. So I want to ask you about that in a moment. But before we yeah. get there, I'm, I'm curious how you define category. And what I mean is, you know, we all are familiar with like the f- official categories that like a yeah. Gartner or a G2 crowd would, would put out there. And that's certainly a good place to start. But I'm curious how you define what a category is and what category creation means. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's probably worth me just, you know, mentioning that, yeah, I, I certainly have not uh, written a book on on category creation or design, nor do I consider myself an expert, but, you know, love to offer my perspective as an operator uh, operating within uh, an environment where we are really trying to create a category. So my spin or sort of my riff on the idea is that I feel like a category can truly be created when the different levels of your customer base Uh, refer to your brand and your product uh, in the same light, right? So if you're an end user, the actual administrator or the operator, uh, the user of your product and your your decision maker, uh, in many cases, an executive, the the man or the woman with the budget, they view the experience and the environment and the ultimate uh, benefits that you provide in the same fashion and then ideally within the same verbiage, right? So, So category is, you know, how you're defined and how you're differentiated by experience benefits and the economics that you provide. And then category creation is when, you know, your customer, your buyer, all those different levels of that buyer, they're viewing you within that same lens. Got it. So you're, it's like when your customers talk about you and think about you or or potential customers think about you, when they talk about the problem and the solutions that, that exist to solve that problem, they kind of equate that language in in the same lens as how they would talk about your own company. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Like if they're first off, if you're buyer and also, I'm sorry, if you're user and you're their boss, if you will, the ultimate decision maker are viewing your, your company, your brand, your product in different lights. That's, that's not always a great thing, right? You want them to both be viewing, viewing you in the same light because then that ultimately shows that there is broad awareness for your category and broad awareness for your category means that all different elements of your buyer uh, from the the lower level individual to the senior individual, 
have seen that there's a need for this category, right? Mm -hmm. So they're viewing in that same lens because they've really bought into it. They've embraced it. So they've joined you uh, along this journey. And if it's just sort of the operators, the admins who sort of uh, view you in that light and refer to you uh, around your category, that's good too. But you really obviously want um, those strategic folks too to view view you in that light too, because they're the ones who are going to kind of connect you with, you know, other peers that they have and are going to kind of continue to evangelize for your uh, brand more broadly as well. Yeah, totally makes sense. You and I were talking before the interview about how you've been in this mass notification category. And I believe that is an established a name category in, in at least one yes. place or another. And you felt at some point that that was kind of holding you back in terms of the market you could address. And you came up with this, this term you're calling critical event management. So walk me through like what led to that decision. Did you guys come up with that name for critical event management? How did that come about? Just what was that whole process like? Yeah, absolutely. And first off, I mean, we still are a fit within the mass notification category. So while we are defining this new category, critical event management, you know, if you still are going to view companies within the mass notification uh, space, we're still a clear leader and we have no problems being defined as a leader in that space as well, because it's still a completely viable space. Uh, so and this it, isn't about like replacing that category and discarding it. It's, it's like evolving what your company can address. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Right. We, we knew we would always be able to solve the problems that are inherent within the mass notification category, but we're interested in solving broader uh, problems. Right. So, you know, as any marketing forward organization wants to do, we wanted to follow our customers and, and learn more about the problems that they have that are maybe a little bit you know, more extensive than the problems that can be solved by mass notification. Uh, and if we followed those problems, we realized that it would be very likely that we could provide solutions to meet those. And that's how we've sort of landed on critical event management, which is sort of a more umbrella overarching term to, de- to define those problems that our customers have, right? They have a need uh, to centralize their response activities, their assessment activities, uh, their location activities, and their communication activities around critical events. So in addition to communication tools, which would be defined within mass notification, they need functionality to improve visualization, assessment, automated workflow enhancement, analysis, situational intelligence. And we, through our platform and our capabilities and our product development, could offer those and create a more unified operating and environment that solves these more advanced challenges that are much better defined by this more umbrella categorization, critical event management. Gotcha. So this old category still kind of sits within this new critical event management category. It's, it's kind of a component of, of the broader offering you, you deliver now. Yep, absolutely. That's, that would definitely be one way to position it. Many of our companies will refer to mass notification as a product because it is also actually a product name for, for Everbridge. And that's sort of the, the communications piece. But the other pieces of the critical event management category include functionality that's more focused on um, centralizing many activities, managing tasks, and managing the overall life cycle of a critical, a critical event beyond just the notification piece. Okay. Did you guys come up with that term, critical event management? We did. Yes, we did. We came up with that term. And again, it was, it was developed in response to real world challenges that we saw our largest uh, organizations uh, dealing with. They had all these different tools uh, for safety and security, but they weren't, they weren't speaking to each other. Mm. Uh, and so we knew that if we could connect those tools as one through a common operating picture of risk, we would really be providing them with the types of capabilities that they needed. And, it, and as part of that process, learning from them, we found that critical event management was a better term that defined what we were really offering beyond just communications. Sure. And so did you just sit down and say, look, we're going to come up with a new term and then work through a process to come up with that name? Or was it more of an organic process? What was that, uh, what was that process well, like? Yeah, it's a little bit of an iteration off of critical communications and critical communications was sort of a iteration off of mass notification or, you know, quite honestly, the, the category might have been more, uh, it might be better defined as emergency uh, notification and mass notification is sort of a, a line term or in our case, our product term. But then we sort of transitioned more to what we called critical communications because we thought that was a little bit broader uh, because it's not just when you need to reach people in mass, right? Mass notification sort of denotes you're reaching out to your entire city 
uh, during a, a calamity event, uh, or you're reaching out to your entire employee base. Critical communications uh, to us denoted more targeted notifications. Maybe you only need to reach 100 IT resolvers during an outage. Maybe you only need to reach five uh, facility executives uh, during a, a fire event or during something else related to your facilities. Maybe you only need to reach one of your offices if you're a global organization with multiple offices around the, the, the globe. So then the next iteration was, well, it goes beyond just communications, just alerting and confirming and accounting for people and getting them you know, on, on a conference bridge. It's also about arming them with other tools to get in front of those events. Uh, that's why we have a visualization capabilities and risk assessment capabilities, uh, data intelligence feeds to really pull out that in, help them be more proactive uh, in their response and management uh, to events. And again, even though we call it critical event management, we are also quick to, to, to mention and to clarify that not everything that we're doing uh, with our customers, not everything we're empowering for our customers involves emergency events. Um, sure. It's really just anything that requires uh, action in a relatively time-sensitive manner, right? So while well, obviously an event that's you know as troubling as like an active shooter scenario, that, that is certainly a critical event in an emergency, things that are a little bit more operational or routine in nature they're still, they still may be a critical event for a business, right? You know, a, a, a disruption to a supply chain uh, that's, you know, impacting inventory in a retail store doesn't necessarily bring a life safety challenge with it, but it definitely brings a significant business challenge. And on that light, it's certainly a critical event. Yeah. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because, you know, the definition of that category, it's not something that people get maybe the first time they hear it. And, and so there was, there's a point where you guys, you said you came up with this term yourselves. So at, at some point in time that just existed within the, the walls of Everbridge. Sure. And there was the point where you had to you know, tell your first customer or your first partner, I don't know who it was about this idea called critical event management. It was a new term for them. And I know you're in, it's kind of still in this process of right. evangelizing that, but what were the, some of the first things you did once you decided that was a term and you wanted to you know, take that out to the world? Yeah. And I mean, you know, to, to riff off of that, I mean, in a perfect world, and this kind of gets back to your earlier question. Yeah. It's kind of your customers who are defining the term, right? I mean, that is the, that is ultimately the goal here, right? You're, you're responding to the challenges that your customers have. So if they're talking about something, they probably are already evangelizing a concept or a term. Uh, mm-hmm. So that would be the perfect world. But in our case, uh, they're just, the market was just sort of ripe for, for this types of terminology. Because again, as I mentioned, Safety and security, and we're talking about we're talking more about physical security. There's all different types of sort of categories and product lines within this space, and we just saw an opportunity to really unify as much of this as possible. So once we really did sort of develop that that strategy, I mean, the first thing is you really have to have you know your employees swinging from the same tree. Uh, so you really have to de- develop defined positioning. You got to define what the category is, what what the term is. You have to define why it's important. You know, what is that impact that this category can ultimately have on an organization? And in our case, because we sort of evolved the category for mass notification, we wanted to define potential impacts and results that went beyond life safety, right? Because that's, that's the other piece that goes along with emergency notification. Uh, the ROI is generally life safety, lives uh, that could be saved by uh, an individual receiving an alert, knowing not to step on a train during a potential terrorist attack, knowing not to veer into the path uh, of, a, of a tornado. Uh, but with critical event management, in addition to those life safety benefits, it can be more about um, business results and ROI, faster resolution to IT incidents, faster resolution to a critical equipment malfunction, things of that nature. So we had to define the what and the how first and really make sure that that was embedded in, in our employees and our, and our sales teams. And they're thinking about, you know, our, our company and our brand. And then we really had to work with our most strategic customers, the ones who had sort of helped us already shape this vision. We had to continue to brainstorm with them. If they weren't leveraging Everbridge for some of the use cases that we felt uh, comprised this new category, we work with them to see where else we could be deployed, how we could expand our product to help execute those use cases and then, you know, wherever possible, highlight those success stories from those customers. Get them to, to buy into this vision, this category with us. Get them to realize that 
while we are talking about transforming a space, transforming safety and security, we're also, as a byproduct, helping to transform their role. We're trying to show that safety and security can be more of a strategic function to their business. So in that light, we're trying to make them heroes as well. And when I say them, we're talking about the, the core customers that we're working with. Again, you know, the operators and also the more strategic decision makers. So really looking at like at them as sort of collaborators in this space and you know, trying to get them to see that they are on the same journey as us and work with them on presentations that they can then also share at industry events, you know, so that we have a, a more defined set of industry events in the safety and security space, but they're important and a lot of our a lot of our buyers and our community members are there. So we try to get folks speaking at those events from the customer side. We like to get them speaking at our user groups, developing testimonials, and really just helping to just sort of um, empower them to share more about the challenges that are inherent in this market, right? So, so a combination of you know why Everbridge has been a great partner in this critical event management journey, but also getting them to just talk about the, their, their perspectives you know, their challenges, their ideas, because that just shows that we sort of are directly aligned, you know, with their day-to-day operations. And we are invested in elevating um, their own profiles along a similar path. Yeah. There's, I think, two things that I'll just kind of recap from that, because you made some some really good points there. Uh, you know, the first one is you talked about going on through this process with your customers and developing this as a response to problems that they had encountered. Maybe they didn't know they could be solved. They didn't ha- maybe they didn't know how to solve them. But you weren't just contriving a category to say, hey, we're building a category, but you, you look, recognize that there was a need in the market and you know, your customers were kind of headed this direction and your job was to kind of capture that momentum and that discussion and make it something really like visceral and succinct that, that, that kind of leads to the second point, which is it's not just you like trying to like beat the drum of critical event management on your own, you focused on equipping your customers to talk about it themselves, which is really, I think, goes back to the, what you said at the very beginning of this episode, where you know people are defining the problem and your solution in kind of the same set and through that same lens. I think that's when that happens is when you've taught your customers how to understand this category, what it means, what it means for them. And then when they're talking about it, it becomes something a little bit bigger than just Everbridge. It becomes kind of a broader uh, you know, category out in the market. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I'm definitely not the person who coined this, but I mean, I feel that, you know, customers are probably the best member of your marketing organization because um, they're the ones that are providing you with the ideas that you really should be building all of your marketing programs and content off. And they're also the ones that are out there uh, that should be doing the real opining for you on the need uh, for the solutions that you're providing. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are publicly traded, which means you have a group that you uh, have to speak to that others, uh, others don't. That's uh, that's the investment community. So tell me about that. What role did they play in this effort? Was that something you had to sell them on or, you know, how did that all play out? Well, you know, it's a great, it's a great question because I, I probably should have mentioned it up front when we were talking about, again, sort of the evolution from the emergency notification category to critical event management. You know, part of that journey, you know, quite honestly, is about increasing total addressable market, right? So that was a big exercise that, you know, we needed to go through and we needed to take that community through as we prepared for our IPO. And, you know, if you follow our stock performance or our earnings reports or our earnings calls, you'll see that we're continuing uh, to evangelize uh, that message uh, about how we have created a very robust and scalable platform that continues to support these emerging and evolving use cases that really elevate our addressable market, right? So when you're just talking about emergency notification, it's more limited usage. You might have organizations that only need to use Everbridge, you know, once a month, maybe in some cases once a year. But now with critical event management, more applications designed for more operational, routine, uh, daily usage. In some cases, you're getting, you know, threat feeds and, and threat visualization in real time, 24-7. You're, you're using it every day. You're getting value for it every day. And that has increased our, our market and our, our buyer environment and has obviously increased, um, you know, our ability to get users to get, to get more out of the tool and to use more of Everbridge. Yeah. No, that's smart. It, it kind of reminds me of that article in um, 
Harvard Business um, that came out a few months ago, and it talks. It looks at the Fortune 100 and some of the economics around building a category. And they looked at the. I think maybe there's like 13, a dozen or so companies that had built new categories of that Fortune 100. And of those 13, they captured it was something like 50% of the growth in market cap and like 76% of the it was either growth in revenue or, or profitability. I don't recall exactly, but the point is there were outsized returns for companies that. Um, we're able to develop and own new categories. And it sounds that's very similar to the message that you brought out to your investors was, um, this isn't just a branding exercise. It's not just something to keep marketing busy, but this is, if done right, it's going to have huge returns on investment for our business. Yep. Yes, that's that's very true. Yeah, and I, I know the, the article you're referring to, and I, I think that's definitely part of a sort of a guiding principle for, for what we're doing here and um, you know why it's so important. Uh, to the sort of fabric of, of what we do on a, on a daily basis from a, from a marketing side of things. Yeah, sure. All right. Quick question, Jeff. All the time you've been involved as a, as a category creator, the greatest moment of fear along the way, greatest uh, triumph you encountered as well. Yeah. I think one of the fear, the great question, I, I think one of the, the fears is that as you create a category, you don't want to forget about your base because, you know, even though you're trying to bring your entire, you're trying to evolve your entire category, your entire industry to view their problems through this new lens, there are going to be, there are still going to be organizations and entities that uh, maybe have, you know, more of a basic need. You know, they might just need to reach uh, their 5,000 community members during, you know, one or two events per year. So you want to still, the fear is like, you don't want to let them uh, leave them behind. So you still have to, Make sure that you're you're wrapping your arms around them from a sales and marketing perspective, mm-hmm. and showing them that you know this is a vision. And while you might not see the value of it yet, over time you will. Uh, so if you feel like our our messaging is you know maybe not completely directed at you, that's okay. We're still going to do everything we can to serve you. Uh, just just stick with us, and you'll see you'll see it click uh, soon enough. So that that's always been a fear. Uh, but I think you know, and then on the triumph side of things, you know, to counter that. You know, again, as a customer marketing and advocacy professional, that's sort of, sort of, sort of the, the new field that I've really started to, to focus a lot of my efforts around. You know, the biggest triumphs for me are when we're able to highlight how successful our organizations are at solving their challenges, not at how they embrace Everbridge, but how they have utilized a combination of tools, including Everbridge, and they've refined their processes and they've had a terrific outcome because of that. And one of the ways we've done that is we have a critical event management award program that we launched a couple of years ago. So this will, this will be our third year. And uh, we have the program, the old program is open to all of our customers on a global basis. And again, it's about highlighting their success stories, overcoming a challenge that they had, uh, meeting an objective that is critical uh, to their organization, and having some results that again, either you know achieve something related to life safety, uh, you know, accounting for employees who, you know, were traveling during a terrorist event, or again, something related to improving business outcomes. And so the real triumph has been how I've seen the number of nominations we've seen come in, you know, increase, you know, you know, a hundred X over the first two years, mm. and I think is going to continue to increase this year and getting to see those, those stories, getting to read them, see the impact that these organizations are having on their organizations or their communities. Again, Triumph to me is not about the impact that Everbridge is necessarily having on those organizations. It's more about the impact that our customers are having on their stakeholders, their employ, their fellow employees, or their residents. Uh, so that, that's a tangible one. And then, you know, I'd also just mention that we also have a user conference that is evolving to be more of an industry conference. It's called Resilience. Last year was the second year that we hosted that event. So next year will will be our third year. And that's also a triumph too, just seeing how that event has continued to grow uh, from an attendee size, but also from a um, speaker perspective, right? So, you know, this year we had uh, industry and customer speakers from organizations like the Dow Chemical Company, Valero Energy, CBS. It just kind of shows how mainstream within that security and safety space, some of these challenges are, uh, becoming uh, such to the point where people want to get up there. They want to talk about these things. They want to socialize with others uh, in the industry. And they also want to sort of, you know, align with us on this journey 
and help us transform this space. Nice. I like how with both those, like the event and then the award, those have value to your customers, um, but they're also serving double duty as um, a means to further promote the category. So I think that's really smart. Yeah, it's great. And I just to rip up that real quick, I mean, I'm one who thinks even though customer marketing is sort of my, my domain currently, I'm one who's really more invested in just um, advocating for the industry as a whole. So you know, if I were to, to launch a, a tactic tomorrow uh, around soliciting you know, perspectives on a common challenge uh, in the global security world, let's just talk about you know, lone worker safety. I see no problem query, uh, querying folks you know, across the industry, whether it's a customer or a prospect. Because at the end of the day, uh, you really want to evangelize the entire buyer, the entire industry, and not just your customers. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, Jeff. Well, look, I want to close things out with one question I've started to ask all of my uh, category creation guests. It's, uh, you've been, you've been Everbridge, you know, five years and change, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So if you could go back roughly five years and give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, that's a, uh, that, that is a great question. There's a lot of advice I probably would give because I've, I've definitely grown up a lot from a, from a marketing perspective in that time, partly because, um, you know, prior to Everbridge, um, most of my background was centered around public relations uh, and primarily working for PR and, and digital marketing agencies. So I guess if I had one piece of advice, it would be, and this is more broad marketing advice, it would be, you know, just continue to learn every single day. Try to, to develop and hone a new skill set every single day. If you're someone who's starting in a, a B2B marketing organization and you're, I mean, I guess at that time I was, you know, hadn't even turned 30 Look at it as just an an, int- an entree to becoming more of a of a generalist. Try to expose yourself to everything. Try content marketing. Try uh, PR. Try marketing demand generation if you can. Send out emails. Learn Marketo. Learn Salesforce. Learn how to run an event. Learn how to run an internal event or an internal meeting. Leverage you know you know hone your skills. Hone your your PowerPoint skills. You you know your your copywriting skills. Things of that nature. So that, that's from a marketing perspective and then maybe more relevant or more germane to our conversation here uh, from, from category creation. I think that the customer advocacy journey has really sort of taken off in the last two or three years. So, so five years ago, I would have said, first things first, um, meet with your customers uh, from, from day one. If I could have gone back to it, you know, there was probably a year or so where I wasn't as close to the customers, especially the ones who were helping us uh, shape this category creation journey. So if I could have met with them, learned from them as quickly as possible, I would have had a faster awareness of the problems that they're, that they're dealing with. And then we maybe uh, would have been able to develop some of our category messaging even faster and gotten it out to market uh, in a more efficient manner. Good stuff. All right. Lots of good advice there, Jeff. If uh, one of our listeners wants to get in touch with you, maybe ask a question about category creation, category design, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, very available on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Jeff Bonanto. Uh, Twitter is uh, J Bonanto, B E B E N A N T O. Uh, and those are probably uh, the best ways to reach me. I also do blog about um, customer marketing and customer advocacy and talk about category design and creation as well uh, on Medium as well. Uh, and you can find that through my, my Twitter bio. All right. Nice. Jeff, thanks again for being with us. A lot of good advice today and, and you're really just actionable information since you guys are in the midst of of building this category. So thanks again for being with us. It was a real pleasure to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.